you are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week would go a long way. Also, please make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life. Um, so I have to show you my t-shirt before I get started. So don't get weirded out. There's a t-shirt underneath, I promise. <laughs> but I was given this by Daryl and Bobette <laughs> to... Uh, and when they gave it to me, they were, I was like, I got to preach in that shirt. But there's so much glory on it, I have to cover it up. I don't want to, it's like, it's like Moses in the veil right there. Um, you can only take one gym face. I don't want to overwhelm you. Okay. Hallelujah. All right. All right, I'm going to pray after that spiritual moment right there. Okay. So, Father, just... God, thank you for your presence that's here. Lord, I am just so humbled that I get to be the speaker today. I just ask for your grace to be upon me to say only what you want me to say. Lord, I pray that every heart listening to me in this room and online would be open to hear you. That God, any, any lies of the enemy would be broken and that we would be good soil to hear your word and that it would bear fruit for the glory of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so I have uh, been having multiple conversations with people throughout the congregation over the last several weeks that have just like caused my heart to burst. Like, you know, you can tell if you've listened to me speak a lot, I absolutely love seeing people find God and then find what he wants them to do. Amen. I am completely, utterly convinced that it is not the pastor's jobs to do all ministry, but rather it's the leader's job to equip the saints to do the works of ministry, which it says in Ephesians chapter four. And so I've just had people coming up to me in conversations and they're like, yeah, I, I have a heart to minister to this group of people. Someone was like, I, have a, I feel like the Lord wants me to start going into prisons. Other people are like, I have a heart for men. Like just all these different people randomly telling me, God is speaking to me about something he wants me to do. Amen. And then on top of that, just I had a conversation with a guy last week and I actually like texted him in the middle of the week. I'm like, I'm still blessed from our conversation like four days ago. Because he is like crazy prophetic and he never knew it. And he's like, I never knew what all this stuff was. And now I'm starting to figure out that's God. And I'm like, yes, it is. And then I started thinking, well, how many other people are in this church and God is doing things in them and through them. And they're not even aware that it's actually the Holy Spirit trying to come out and awaken them into their purpose and their destiny. And so I've had this thing of discipleship on my heart for weeks and weeks. And um, it like occurred to me that discipleship kind of unlocks the things that are inside of us. Amen. And I'm going I'm to get on that a little bit more. And there's this thing, I definitely didn't come up with it. It's existed since before I was born. But there's this quote that says, the church is called to make disciples, not converts. So many people think, I just get people saved. Or they think, I got saved. Listen, I'm, I'm going to heaven when I die. I have given my sins to Jesus. He has taken my punishment, and he's given me his clean record. He's given me his righteousness. He's given me his access to the Father. Like, I'm clean, and when I die, I know that I'm going to go to heaven. And then they stop. And they're like, well... I'll see you when I'm 80, 89. That's not discipleship. That's 
being a convert. You converted. You got saved. You're going to heaven. But I, I was actually thinking about this analogy. I'm sure it'll break down at some point, so don't pick it apart. But it's like, imagine you, you go to heaven. The end of your life, you step, you step in, and you're like, I'm here. It's amazing. And Jesus is like, I'm so glad you're here. And he gives you a big hug. And he's like, come on, let's go. I got so much to show you. I want to reveal myself to you. I'm going to show you things you've never experienced. And you're like, I'm good. I'm in. Like the gate's right here. And he's like, no, 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 come on in. Listen, you have no idea what is here. You're like, no, I'm in. What, what do you want? I'm good. I'm good. He's like, no, no, there's like purposes and plans and the glory of God. Like you have so much as your inheritance is my child. And you're like, but I'm in, I'm good. And I think there's a lot of Christians. You're not aware that there's so much more to your faith than what you have actually experienced. This is not a message of of condemnation or guilt or anything, but an invitation into knowing there is so much more for you than you have possibly imagined. And as we are discipled and as we learn about the kingdom of God and who he is and who we are in him, it unlocks something that we never dreamt. And as I'm talking to people who are like, this thing's stirring inside of me. I've got this burden. I've, these gifts are coming out of me. Like, I feel like this is the season to dive into discipleship. Wow. This is the season to go, God, teach me what you need me to know. Because it says in Matthew 28, most people know the Great Commission, Jesus told the disciples, go make disciples teaching them to do everything I've taught you to do. There's a teaching that comes along with discipleship. It's more than just going to heaven. And the coolest thing I was studying, like what did is, what is discipleship look like when Jesus was walking the earth? And discipleship in the Jewish culture is way more intense than I thought. The goal, when you became a disciple of a rabbi, your goal was to look and to live exactly like your rabbi. Like everything they did, you were emulating. Everything, how they read the scriptures, how they treated their families, everything they did, you were studying them because you wanted to be exactly like them. And so as we become disciples of Jesus, the greatest rabbi, The goal in him saying make disciples is, I want my people to look exactly like I do. I want my people to walk like I walked. I want my people to love like I loved. I want my people to have compassion and forgiveness just like me. When Jesus walked on the scene, it says demons fled. They bowed. It says that he went about doing good and destroying all the works of the devil. And so as his disciples, we get the right and the inheritance that we get to do the same. It says in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus talking, a disciple is not above his teacher but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. We get to be like Jesus. There is so much more to Christianity than getting in the gate of heaven and knowing I'm good. There is a life of bringing heaven to earth just like Jesus did. If you think about it, Jesus and the title, I think I titled this Freedom and Discipleship. I'll have to look at my notes or ask Dina. But think about it. Jesus Though he was the most free man ever. He lived in a communion with God. He never doubted who he was. He lived with a supernatural compassion for people. He had an ability to love people. Like I've, cha- I've shared before, like his, his ability to even like forgive the people literally nailing him to a cross while they're doing it. Like, I mean, that is not something I can do. He didn't have addictions. He didn't have fears. He didn't have anxiety. He was God. And we get to be his disciples. 
Meaning we get to walk and live in that same freedom. We have the, he paid for it, for us to have it. And I see the thing is, that is impossible. I just said, I can't forgive people like that. I don't like people as much as Jesus does. It's just like, he uh, like, you know, like I'm, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. So I'm like, okay, well, here I am. I'm at whatever level of discipleship, but he's perfect. And I'm like, this is impossible. It's impossible to be a disciple of Jesus where I look just like my teacher. But the path to that, I think you need a new, a deeper understanding of grace. Because most people just see grace as forgiveness. And it is. It's, it's the grace of God. I can't make peace with God in my own performance because my own performance isn't good enough. That's why the law is there to point out my faults and my failures. So I go, I need help. And the grace of God comes down and he gives me that clean record. He gives me that peace with God, unearned, undeserved. It says he pulls me out of the miry clay and puts my feet upon a rock and puts a new song in my mouth just because he's good. Because he loves you. Because he loves me. That is grace. But there is another aspect of grace, which is an empowering aspect of grace. To do things that you and your own ability cannot do. That is as much grace as forgiveness. When Paul was complaining to God, going, I have this thorn in my side and I can't take it anymore. What does Jesus say? My grace is sufficient for you. He says, Paul says later in, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, where he's like, I labor more than everybody else, but it's not me, it's the grace of God inside of me. Amen. See, it's, it's grace, there is an empowerment to it. In fact, it says, sin will not have dominion over you before you are not under law, but under grace. So even the ability to not live under sin is the same gift, kindness, love, compassion. And as we learn that, wait, I can't make this happen, but you can, all of a sudden, I'm looking more and more and more like the one who lives inside of me. See, here's the thing. He's already in there. It says that it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me, right? It says in Colossians that Christ in you is the hope of glory. So the perfect one is already in here. So I believe discipleship is like uncovering Jesus inside of you. It's like, wait, you mean that attitude is actually not of the Lord? And you're like, and he, then he wipes it away. And then you're like, wait, that fear, it, wait, I don't have to be afraid? What? And I got scripture for it. And it gets wiped away. And you become more and more free. You become more and more like our teacher. And we become the men and women of God who affect the world. And who bring peace and love and joy and destroy the works of the devil. Amen. See, there's so much more than just making it to heaven. Come on. There is a world that is waiting for you to understand who God is. And waiting for you to know who you already are in Christ. Jesus. I had a conversation with a guy about two weeks ago. And he's like, I know on the inside, I am a powerful man of God. He said, but I'm, he goes, Let, let's say that's me up on a hill. He goes, I live down here in the valley. I know that's who I am. I see whispers of that guy. I see little hints. He'll come out. He'll show up. He's like, and then I retreat back down the hill. He's like, I know. You don't even have to convince me that that's who I really am, but I keep retreating down the hill. Come on. Discipleship moves you up the hill because it sets you more and more free, just like Jesus. Jesus told the disciples, he's like, come follow me. They went where he went. They watched how he lived. 
It says, let me look here real quick, and I will find it without saying anything. Um, <laughs> this is in Mark chapter 3, verse 14. It says, he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Amen. The first thing that a disciple was called to do was be with their teacher. Amen. Not visit their teacher on Sunday morning, Come on. but be with him. Come on. Live with him. Let his presence influence how they live. Let his presence. I mean, if you think about it, if you're living, if you're one of the disciples and you're following Jesus every day, it's going to have an effect on you. Amen. You're going to be a heck of a lot more hopeful when you see Jesus on a regular basis, just pulling impossibilities out left and right. You're going to be like, oh, wait, you do this stuff. I'm going to hang like teach me how to do that. And then when you face the impossible situation, after watching him just do it and he goes, you can do that, then you do it. And then all of a sudden, miracles start following your life because you've learned from the teacher. And so it says that they were called to be with him. Ultimately, that is the highest calling of a Christian is to be with him. Before you preach a sermon or share your faith or anything else, God wants you to be with him. He wants you to take time where he is your focus. Like worship doesn't always have to be music. Sometimes worship is, I'm going to take this thing that is actually super important and I'm going to lay it to the side and I'm going to look at you because that sets him up as preeminent to even the issues of life. Worship is not just songs. It's allowing him to be preeminent above all things. Sometimes, like the decisions we make are worship. Sometimes, you know, you're staring that temptation in the eye. And you're like, oh, that looks real good. <laughs> when you can go, but he's preeminent and you turn and you walk away. That's worship. That's as much worship as any song you'll ever sing. I have that time, you know, I told you, uh, I, was like, I think it was last summer, some girl gave me like this nastiest look in Chick-fil-A. I was trying, and I, I mean, rage just, whoa. I mean, she gave me a terror, like, like I did something. I stopped to let her go by, I was in the drive-thru, and she like looks at me, and I mean, I literally reached for the window, like, hey! And the Lord was like, stop! <laughs> I mean, it was, I was, I was hot, I'll put it that way. And uh, anyway, guess what? As clunky as that is, worship. Super clunky. But I was like, yes, Lord. You're the teacher. Yes, Lord, you're the Lord. You're the one in charge. You get to define who I am. You get to define how I behave. And the more we are discipled, the more we look into who he is, the more we look into the way he does things, the freer we get. And the freer we get. Um, it says somewhere, I believe it's Psalms 103, or 105, I think 103, where it says, the children of Israel knew God's deeds, but Moses knew his ways. You can know somebody's deeds from a distance. You can be like, oh, Tim's standing back there. Hey, Tim. I'm up here. But to know why Tim does what Tim does, I have to know Tim. I have to actually converse with him and be like, so get to know him, get to know his history, get to know his life and find out why do you do what you do? So the children of Israel knew God has fire on mountains and split seas and does all kind of cool stuff. 
frees slaves, but Moses knew why. We get to the we get to have the relationship with God where he can sometimes show us why he does what he does. That definitely is not 100%. There are certain things we'll never know. But when you're discipled, when you go from being a convert to a disciple, you begin to have an understanding, a revelation of how the kingdom works. And the more you do, the more access you begin to pull out of it the more peace you begin to live in, the more freedom you begin to live in because you're looking at life through the eyes of Jesus, your teacher, who we are called to be just like. You know, again, I was saying Jesus is the most free man ever. He didn't have any sin. He didn't live under shame and condemnation. He didn't have addictions. And he offers us that same position. He lived in peace with people, forgave people. And then he says in Matthew 11, I use this verse all the time. But he says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I preach on that sermon all the time, that sermon, that scripture all the time. I bring it up all the time. But I pulled a new thing out of it yesterday. It says, learn from me. I've bypassed that for the most part. He's like, let me teach you how to do what I do. That's his heart, is for him to teach you. The Holy Spirit is also our teacher, our helper, to empower us and to show us what truth is, to show us what we have in Christ. That's like there's this move of God to help us look and live more and more like who we already are in Christ. But the thing about that is, It requires humility because sometimes the teaching isn't going to look the way I want it to look. Sometimes I'm going to be like, I don't like that. I want to put my window down and yell at the Chick-fil-A lady. (laughs) Sometimes the lesson isn't the lesson I want. And the thing is, even to learn from someone, you have to humble yourself and admit, you know something I don't. You have something that I don't, and I, in my humility, say, teach me. Show me what you got. And I think so many people, they don't like humility. They're like, I got this. I'm good. I'm not good. I need help. (laughs) I need Jesus. I needed him to forgive me. I need him to strengthen me. I need him to help me in everything. I need the Holy Spirit. I need grace to enable me and strengthen me and to empower me to live like my teacher. I cannot do it on my own. And so there's this place of humility that is required. You imagine if you're back in the day and there's a, a rabbi who you want to disciple you. It takes humility to come up to them and be like, look, I I see the presence of God on your life. I want to learn from you. That's humility. If we come to God with a humble heart, say, teach me, he's going to do it. You're going to find you're moving up that hill faster and faster, almost without trying, just because he's teaching you. He's freeing you. And so I I actually, I have an example of this in my own life. I, uh, excuse me. In Galatians chapter five, I was, uh, so a lot of you guys know Alan Scott, the, the musician, worship leader, that guy. We are good friends. And, um, back in the day, this is like 2007 or eight, probably eight, yeah, around there. 
he called me, or we were chatting, and he goes, listen, my friend Mark gave me a CD, a sermon, it's in CDs, still back then, CD day, said, I got this sermon, and it wrecked my life. You should listen to it. Great. So I listened to it. Little did he tell me, it's a two and a half hour preach. Like, I'm pushing it at 35. I'm like, man, I'm tired and I'm the one talking. Like, I don't know how you feel. Two and a half hours, man. I was hanging on every word. I, I, I just, and when it was over, I sat and I'm like, God, I've never heard that before. But all he did was use Bible. I can't argue any of it. And I am burning on the inside. I don't know what to do about this. If this isn't you, you're going to have to tell me because it certainly looks like it is. And it was based in Galatians chapter 5. And it's verse 4, which says, You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. My entire life, and I grew up in church, went to Bible college, and had been in ministry for like five years at this point. I never understood that I was justified by Jesus alone. I was always under the impression that my performance and my ability to be good enough determined my relationship with God, determined how he felt about me, determined how he treated me. And I lived under that and it was bondage because I was never good enough and fully aware of it. And so I just lived under guilt and condemnation all the time. And so I listened to this sermon that says, If you're going to try to get right with God by being good enough, by the law, by performing these things, you are severed from Christ and you have fallen away from grace. And the preacher made the point. He said, you know, when like a businessman or a pastor or somebody falls into sin, we say they fell from grace, right? He said, that's completely not what that means. He's like, You fall from grace when you take the place of grace and go, I'll do it good enough so that God will bless me and accept me. You've fallen away from the offer that Jesus has already paid for. I'm like, get out of here. This is, and again, two and a half hours of just Bible, 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 backing this up. And at the end, again, I'm sitting there like, what? And it has, without a doubt, I think been the most life-altering thing I've ever learned. I, like, I stepped out of ministry shortly thereafter and just got discipled along with Alan by this guy. And then we had a Bible study and then all these prayer meetings. And then eventually God told me one day, I'm gonna put you back in ministry. And like the next day, the church contacted me and was like, would you like to teach a class? I'm like, yes. I was like, can I teach on grace? They're like, teach whatever you want. There we go. <laughs> and I've been, back, I've been in ministry ever since. So I tell you that story for A, it's phenomenal. You shouldn't get that. Read Galatians. It's amazing. But then also I'm telling you, I got discipled into freedom. I got discipled into something that was there the whole time that I was completely unaware of. And somebody broke open the scriptures and taught me something that I didn't know. And the presence of God flooded in through that crack and it changed my life and it changed my ministry. There are things like that for you. I'm not saying every day you're gonna read something in the Bible and it's gonna throw you against the wall like, my God. But nonetheless, There's stuff for you in the kingdom. There's things the Lord wants to teach you. But it requires us to worship him by giving him our attention and our time. It requires us to say, Lord, I really want to watch this TV show, but 
I want to spend time with you even more. Hallelujah. I want to get, like, let me, let me read half a chapter before I turn it on. Let me just spend some time in worship before, before I get to that. Like, putting him into the place of preeminence, the place of a teacher, the place of a rabbi, knowing that as I spend time with the rabbi, I'm going to look more and more like him the longer I do. Like our heart as a church is to create disciples. We want you to go to heaven. But then we know there's more for you. And so when we have like classes on Wednesdays or we have guest speakers come in, like it's to help you and Jesus figure this all out. Like we want to see you Walk in the fullness of who God has called you to be. Amen. We want, our desire is to see you go further than we ever could. Come on. There's, a, there's a thing that's talked about all the time. is like a good teacher, a good pastor, a good leader wants their ceiling to be their disciples floor. Yes. Wow. Where you, have, you just ride up what we've already learned and then you take it to the whole next level. Our heart is for you to do that. We want you to eclipse us in the amount of glory that you carry into your lives. We want you to eclipse us in the anointing that you bring into the places that God sends you. There is something, again, I know for a fact, a handful of you are stirred to do something glorious. And I know that there's even more. So I'm asking you to lean into it. I'm asking you to lay aside the sins that so easily beset us and press on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I think I just combined two different scriptures, but they flow together. Lay the hindrances aside and press in toward the high calling. There's nothing this world can offer you that can take the place of what God has in store for you. Amen. So I'm going to read one more scripture. This is in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And I learned this from being in campus ministry at Christ Community Church a very long time ago. So some of you guys know Todd Horner. He was my, one of my campus pastors, and he would talk about this scripture a lot. It says... I'm going to start in verse 1. It's the second Timothy chapter 2. It says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the present, oh, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So to take this a whole step further, you are actually called not only to be a disciple, but then to disciple other people. God has people in your life that he wants you to be a godly influence to. He wants you to take what the Lord is doing in you and then help other people in that same place. I mean, if you think about it, we are all the results of disciples, discipling disciples, discipling disciples. Like, I mean, unless somebody in your spiritual lineage got saved by an angelic visitation, like you could literally trace your faith back to Jesus. Because Jesus told somebody who told somebody who told somebody who told somebody, blah, 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 you. So keep it moving. You are somebody's spiritual heritage. That's a heck of an heck of a thing for God to say, hey, you have a role to play in this thing. There are people who haven't even been born yet that I want you to affect today. Like this is legacy stuff. I preached on legacy several months ago. You have a spiritual legacy, but it starts It's sourced in discipleship. 
It's sourced in looking to the teacher and looking to his grace to lead you, to guide you, to strengthen you, to anoint you, to see the world touched. Wow. Amen? Amen? All right. So worship team, if you can come up, please. Uh, would you guys stand, please? I'm going to pray. All right, so Father, I thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you that you have called us to be disciples. You have called us to know you deeply and personally and intimately so that we can learn from you so that we can look more and more and more like you. So that you can free us from the things that trip us up, that hinder us. Lord, don't let us be satisfied with anything less than the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But Lord, that doesn't happen if you don't stir us. It doesn't happen if we don't feel or hear the call. So even the things that seek to hinder the call, I break them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that every person within the sound of my voice would hear the call of a loving father calling his kids home and calling them higher. Knowing that it's the blood of Jesus that qualifies us, that our past can't keep us from it, that our faults are covered by the blood of Christ. Help us to hear your call higher. Let a stirring move across this room, across those who can hear me, God, to know that there's more. Lord, we don't wanna just be converts. We wanna be disciples who look like our teacher, who love like our teacher, who carry power like our teacher, who carry compassion like our teacher, who carried joy like our teacher. Says you were anointed with joy more than everybody else. Lord, we wanna be overflowing with joy because that's the way you were. There is so much freedom in our inheritance as the children of God. Lord, I ask that today we would take a hold of that like never before. So if you're here today and you actually, you don't know Jesus, you're, you don't know if you have peace with God, you, you're like, I, I cannot say for certainty that I've given my sins to God, that Jesus has taken them upon him and he's taken my punishment and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I have peace with God, that I'm gonna go to heaven when I die. If that's you, It's just like receiving a gift. You can just whisper to God and say, God, I receive it. I lay down everything at your feet and I pick up the righteousness of Jesus, the clean slate of Jesus, the new life of Jesus. And if you're here today and you feel the Lord stirring your heart, you feel like there's something going on, I, 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 I wanna be a disciple. 
I don't want to just be a convert, but I know there's more. There's more for me to know, more for me to do, more for me to walk in. If that's you, I'm going to actually ask you to come up front as a sign of like, Lord, I recognize that you are calling me into a new way of living that looks like Jesus. A new level of freedom. Lord, I thank you that you're stirring your people. You're stirring your people. That God, we are not just a church who comes here on Sundays, but that Lord, we are a people who look like our teacher and love the world around us into life. I pray for every person that came forward, that Lord, you would blow upon this fire inside of them, that Lord, you would cause it to grow, that you would give them a grace, a fresh grace to fix their eyes upon Jesus, a fresh grace to worship you. kindness that's toward us all. And for those of you who have been stirring, like my friends that I've been talking to over the last few weeks, I want to challenge you to talk to people about it. Don't just keep it in anymore, but give a voice to it. Be like, dude, the Lord has been stirring me to minister to the homeless. The Lord has been stirring me to minister at the Pregnancy Resource Center. The Lord has been stirring me to reach out to my neighbor. Whatever it is, give voice to it. Don't just see it as a thought. See it as God trying to get your attention and get the gears moving into the kingdom moving through your life. Lord, give us discerning hearts to know what is you. That's right. And so God, we give you, just put your hands up and begin to thank him. He's doing something in this room. He's doing something in your life right now. Lord, we thank you that this is an, ex this is an example of grace. We didn't earn this. We didn't deserve it. And yet you call us to represent Jesus in the world. Thank you, God. Help us to see the weight of that. Help us to see the grace of that, the holiness of it. And Lord, I pray from this day forward that the floodgates would be open, that you would release us into the callings. You would release us into discipleship to be with you and then to minister out of that. I pray that you would open up the scriptures to us. I pray that your presence would fill our prayer times. And even when we don't feel anything, we would know that your faithfulness goes beyond our feelings. You are doing great things and we give you all the praise, all the glory and all the honor for it. And we look forward to the testimonies that are gonna come out of the people here. In Jesus' name, amen. You are one of thousands of people enjoying the content produced by Christ Community Church's C3 Media. First, we want to say thank you and let you know it's our pleasure to serve you. As a nonprofit organization, we are always looking for strategic and financial partners. If you are benefiting from our content, we ask that you consider partnering with us. Even a small donation like $1 per week would go a long way. Also, please make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you for your continued support, and we know God has a great plan for your life.